welcome back. Today we are going to do with external financing, growth, indifference analysis, and break-even analysis. Now, in the normal scheme of things, failing to plan means planning to fail. So before a firm commits financial resources to any new venture, whether new or expanding an existing one, it must always ensure that it has enough funds, whether internal or external, to complete the project. And it, was, it must also know when it is starting a new project or when it's expanding, the minimum levels of revenue generation that will ensure that the business is afloat and will bring in profits. This session will therefore walk the students through techniques like growth and external financing, indifference analysis, and break-even analysis. At the end of this session, students should be able to, one, understand how growth and external financing are related, appreciate indifference analysis in making a choice between which source of funding, whether debt or equity or preference shares specifically, would be the best choice to pursue a growth agenda. Understand break-even analysis and also be able to use break-even analysis to make this business decisions for profit. Now, the main topics we'll look at will be the external financing and growth and the indifference analysis, as well as break-even analysis. Now, let's start with external financing and growth. Now, from our previous session, we're able to determine based on our financial planning model that there may be the possibility that we may need external financing to grow or pursue an expansion agenda. Now, normally at low growth levels, internal financing, that is retained earnings, is usually enough to sustain a firm's uh, growth spurt. Now, when growth rate begins to increase, internal financing is usually in, not enough, and the firm will have to go to the capital markets. Now, when you're able to examine the relationship between your growth potential and the external financing required, it helps very much in your long-range planning because it's a very useful tool in de determining at which point on your growth trajectory you may need to go out there to borrow and how much you may need to go out there and borrow. It is important to note that the extent of growth of a firm is largely dependent on the financial capacity of the firm, whether it is from external sources or from internal sources, but the focus usually is about the capacity of the firm to raise funds, especially from external sources. So firms that are normally constrained in terms of access to external financing can therefore only grow as much as the retained earnings they have available for expansion. Now, for this reason, you are able to also then compute the internal growth rate, which tells us how a firm can grow assets using retained earnings as the only source of financing, in which case it is captured as a return on assets multiplied by the retention ratio divided by one less the return of assets ratio multiplied by the retention ratio. Now this tells you that for a firm with figures on the board in the terms of the return on assets and then its retained earnings, the internal growth rate it can achieve, the maximum, is 6.74, meaning that with retained earnings, that is how fast the firm can grow. On the other hand, a firm can sustain a particular growth rate if it can grow using internally generated funds and issuing debt to maintain a constant debt ratio, meaning that by keeping a particular capital structure online, it is able to grow. So here, for a firm that has a return on equity of 29.27 and retain earnings also of 50%, a sustainable growth rate when it is able to top up its needed funds is approximately 17.14. Now that tells us the difference between having access to funds and only having access to internal um, revenue generated that is retained earnings. So a firm's ability to source for external financing is very crucial to its quest to grow beyond the limitations of internal finances. Now, when it comes to indifference analysis, the quest here is to find out at what point a firm can be indifferent between any form of financing, especially be it debt, 
common equity or preference shares. Now, intrinsically, depending on, like we mentioned in our very previous slides, the capital structure of a firm has a lot to play out in terms of the firm's potential for profit and survival. So at any point in time, the obligations that may arise from the source of financing need to be factored into making the decisions as to which of them is best given the environment. So for a given level of operating income, a particular combination of financing will yield a particular earnings per share. And so for a firm that wants to be able to identify which point is the best, Indifference analysis is a process of determining the point at which any two modes of financing will yield the same impact. So given the opportunities available, the firm may choose a particular mode of financing over the other. The value therefore lies in your ability to forecast ahead of time which mode of financing will deliver the best in terms of shareholder wealth maximization, which is the ultimate goal of the financial manager. So we have a formula that looks at the earnings before interest and tax being equated across two different financing regimes. And once you're able to solve to get the EBIT star, that tells you which EBIT or which operating income level will make you indifferent between any particular financing choice, in which case we are looking at a comparison between debt financing and equity financing. The same relationship can also be mapped between debt financing and preference share financing or common stock financing and preference share financing. Now, the importance of this cannot be overemphasized. Now, going forward, every business, be it new or expanding, needs to have an idea of what lies ahead in terms of potential for profits and breaking even. In breaking even, a firm is able to generate enough revenue to cover its total fixed cost and variable cost. Now, at this point, the firm neither makes profits nor makes losses. We say that the, the firm is breaking even. Now, knowing such values ahead of time in terms of the minimum revenue that ensures that a firm will break even will ensure that the firm is also able to determine whether the project or the expansion is a viable option or not. Because if a firm realizes based on the analysis that it is unable to attain that required revenue level, it may decide to scale down or abandon the project altogether. So then, that is how the relevance of break-even point analysis comes to bear. Now, the relevance of it also lies in the fact that it helps to facilitate appropriate pricing because by determining the minimum revenue and the quantum that needs to be produced, pricing is easier to determine. It also gives insights into cost structures and facilitates cost efficiency moves. Now, it's also able to predict the effects of price changes on profit for which reason is relevant typically in price setting and then profit estimation. And it also helps in determining minimum production levels and the possible implications that will require changes in plant sizes and the other forms of what working capital required. Now, this is a graphical representation of break-even analysis. As a firm starts production from the point zero onwards, its total sales begins to improve and rise directly or in increase directly with the number of units sold. In terms of cost, however, its fixed cost is flat. In this case, fixed cost doesn't necessarily vary with sales, and it normally has to capture the fixed elements like machinery and equipment and sometimes salaries that are not related to direct man hours, but rather the number of employees in a firm. Now, when you put that together with variable cost, which is the cost incurred in terms of unit of production, it gives us total cost. The difference between total cost and total sales is what will be profit when it is positive and negative when it is losses. Now, from zero production units through to the point where total revenue and total cost become equal, at this point we achieve break even. Now, any point before the break even point is a loss making region for the firm, and the point beyond break even onwards is usually a profit generating 
uh, portion for the firm. So every firm needs to know to a large extent what minimum number of units or total revenue it must generate in order to begin to move into a profit-making region. And so we have the mathematical representation of what we, we have on the previous slide that looks at equating total revenue to total cost and therefore solving to come out with the minimum requirements in terms of quantity of production to achieve break-even. And when there's a need to add profit, this is added to the function, therefore, to ensure that for a particular given level of profit, the firm is able to determine the minimum quantity of produce or the minimum revenue level it must generate to achieve that. Now, the caveat. In both the financial planning process, especially in the use of break-even analysis, the output is only as good as the input. So therefore, if you make unrealistic assumptions, being overly optimistic and having inappropriately defined relationship in terms of your cost item, the defined relationship will, will yield useless output and will have no relevance for the strategic financial planning process. Now take notes to look at your reading list and then begin to practice more on the relevance of the items we have just studied. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed your session.